it's time for bed. But this woman is not ready for sleep. After years of unhappy marriage, she has discovered feelings that have never been awakened before. I have a lover. I have a lover. At last she was going to know the joys of love, the fever of the happiness she had despaired of. The temptation to be unfaithful is age old. We know we should be content, but we sometimes long for more. The heroine of this 19th century French novel never stops searching for love. Is she a romantic dreamer risking all for love? Or is she a fool chasing an empty illusion? The author, Gustave Flaubert, would probably say both. Gustave Flaubert was a 19th century romantic author at war with his own romantic obsessions. He created Madame Bovary as a way to explore the contradictions of his heart. Our romantic yearnings still lead us astray. Adultery occurs far more often than we care to admit. It is said that the number of married people who have been unfaithful ranges between 50% and 70%. The voices of this hidden, bittersweet world each have their own story to tell. I have always loved my husband deeply, but he got really busy with his career and seemed not to have time for me. Something that has made me feel so much better is helping me to stay in a marriage that has so little in it for me isn't something I'm going to be feeling guilty about. I'm 23, my husband is 24. We're both successful individuals with a large home in the suburbs, two new cars, all the toys. But the reason we came together is forgotten. Locked in the humdrum routine of daily life, couples long for passion and intimacy. It was this way in the 19th century too. Desperate for romance, a young Emma Bovary contemplates adultery and risks everything in the process. Adultery is the threat to all of the values and structures of bourgeois society. A man could accuse his wife of adultery in any context and with very little proof and could actually force very severe punishment on her. A woman who committed adultery was condemned by society as a fallen woman. She would be cast out and stripped of her rights. Unhappy wives like Madame Bovary had a lot to lose. Flaubert, too, set a risky course for himself in creating this character. When the book was published in 1857, he was put on trial for violating religious and public morals. He was acquitted, and his tale of a woman consumed by romantic hunger became popular reading in his time. The story begins when Emma, a farmer's daughter, marries Charles Bovary, a country doctor. He was happy now, without a care in the world. In bed in the morning, his head beside hers on the pillow, he would watch the sunlight on the downy gold of her cheeks. Seen from so close, her eyes appeared larger than life, especially when she opened and shut her eyelids several times on awakening. 
at the beginning she feels fine because she has found a husband. She doesn't really know what it means at that, at that stage, but she knows that she can escape her father's house. And as, at the beginning she's very happy uh, and she's actually acting as being the good housewife. Madame Bovary plunges into her role as the good wife. She makes herself pretty, redecorates the house, and dabbles in the arts. She hopes this will lead to marital bliss. And little by little she realizes that this is not what she thought it should be or it would be. She doesn't know what love is, but she has read a lot of uh, romantic novels. And she built up, probably unconsciously, she built up a sort of stereotypical idea about what love is and what a husband or a man uh, should be. Unfortunately, Charles, seen here in a BBC production of Madame Bovary, is not a man of great imagination. Charles's conversation was flat as a sidewalk, a place of passage for the ideas of every man. He couldn't swim or fence or fire a pistol. One day, he couldn't tell her the meaning of a writing term she had come upon in a novel. Emma has even tried reading love poetry to Charles. But his response was to yawn. Every morning, Charles sets out for a long day of rounds, leaving her alone with her discontent. The young woman, like Emma, had so few dreams which could be realized in the world in which she lived. For Madame Bovary, her husband was her parameters. Her possibilities were completely encapsulated in what his life would offer her. Emma longs for Charles to romance her. But his contentment with the way things are prevents him from understanding that a breach is opening up between them. Flaubert has given Madame Bovary romantic discontent so that he can plumb the depths of his own conflict. Flaubert clearly identifies with Emma, identifies with her romanticism, identifies with her need, her narcissism. Um, at the same time, he hates the part of himself that's like Emma. So he's in an argument, and the argument is in the novel. Through Madame Bovary, Flaubert criticizes the ever-growing desires of the rising bourgeoisie, the French middle class. After the French Revolution of 1789, the bourgeoisie began to redefine the values and customs of social, economic, and political life. One of the changes was the idea of separate arenas for men and women. According to this bourgeois ideal, women were to live their lives at home, away from the world of work. The male domain was outside the home, in factories, businesses, and clubs. This arrangement created a new kind of supply and demand. Factories produced more goods. Stores advertised and sold these goods. And wives and their husbands bought them to keep up with the Joneses. It's the beginning of a consumer society, the very beginning. And for the first time, there are more goods that are available to more people. And there is advertising, which is new and beginning, that makes people aware of the kinds of things that they might have, if only. Emma Bovary's romantic fantasies stem, in part, from this new consumerism. She represents Flaubert's distaste for the materialist bourgeois characters of his time. Of course, Flaubert himself was a materialist bourgeois character. And writing Madame Bovary was an attempt to transcend this. Flaubert was always absolutely obsessed with bourgeois. The bourgeois for Flaubert is the symbol of stupidity. It's a life that is lived according to stereotypes, according to cliches. 
he despises them, but at the same time, he wants to write about them all the time. Uh, it's a kind of revenge for him. Emma Bovary's dissatisfaction sends her on a journey into forbidden territory. She's about to glimpse a world that will change her life forever. In a life where nothing happens, something finally does. Charles and his wife are invited to a ball held by a local aristocrat who Charles once treated. The door opens on a delightful world. She has a beautiful dress. She is extremely well prepared. She doesn't want Charles to dance. And when he wants to kiss her, she refuses him to touch her, saying that he's going to mess up her dress, which is also very important because it shows that she is getting more and more detached. Emma keeps Charles away, but she does dance with a stranger. One of the dancers came up to Madame Bovary and asked her to be his partner. As they pass close to a door, the hem of Emma's gown caught on her partner's trousers, and for a moment, their legs were all but intertwined. The waltz was a promiscuous dance. Until then, people danced minuets and all that. But here, uh, there was an embrace, and there was a gyration, and people could get dizzy. And the way Flaubert describes it, the way their legs intermingle, and the way she almost swoons, it's the analog of a sexual act. It is Madame Bovary's first innocent step towards infidelity. For the first time, Emma witnesses what she's been dreaming of for years and years, that she found in her books uh, and that she doesn't have in her real life. From now on, she's going to be more and more frustrated by Charles. By confirming her romantic fantasies, the ball leaves Emma with a sense of continual frustration. She spends months afterwards longing for what she experienced that evening. Mealtimes confirm for her that Charles is dull and that her marriage is a prison. Emma faces the hardship of the young bourgeois, which is boredom. But everything seems to exist in a kind of deadly repetition compulsion, where each day is like the last day. You keep doing the same things, and those things don't seem to mean anything. Emma feels her misery keenly because she expected so much more. She is a devotee of early 19th century romanticism, which she absorbed, ironically, at the convent where she was educated. I think the beginning of her sexual awakening takes place really when she reads all those books that are smuggled in. She reads about these amorous stories, these romantic love affairs, and of course, all around her there is the smell of incense and the image of the naked body of Christ on the cross. So there is a confusion in her mind between the nakedness of the man on the cross and the books she's reading. The Romantic movement mixed eroticism and transcendence. It emphasized sensation and escape. Above all, Romanticism was about following one's heart, not social convention. She longed to travel. She longed to go back and live in the convent. She wanted to die. And she wanted to live in Paris. Emma feels the bitterness of unfulfilled longing. So from now on, they were going to continue, one after the other like this, always the same, innumerable, bringing nothing. Other people's lives, drab though they might be, held at least the possibility of an event. But to her, nothing happened. It was God's will. The future was a pitch black tunnel ending in a locked door. In our day, too, marriage can be disappointing for newlyweds. Writer Dalma Hain calls this strange feeling of dissatisfaction marriage shock. Marriage shock is when a woman, after 
a month or two months or four months, says, I don't feel like me anymore. I don't know why. I love this guy. We're perfectly happy. But I feel removed from myself. And that's part of entering an institution that is asking women to be removed from themselves. Hain has talked to hundreds of women in the past decade and found that they still unconsciously take on traditional beliefs about how to be a wife. You can read about it in conduct books of the 19th century, but it's in every magazine today. A woman is dutiful, she's thrifty, she's kind, she's loving, she's generous. Above all, she's selfless. And this is an interesting connection with Madame Bovary, because Madame Bovary was hardly selfless. She is just not a good woman in so far as the rules would have it. Marrying the man you love is supposed to lead to a happy life ever after. End of story. But life and fiction often part ways, leaving disenchantment. Young women today may not feel as trapped, but I would almost guess that there's still that feeling there. This is the voice of a woman who has been married for 32 years and turned to affairs after 10. There's the image, there's the role that you're supposed to play as a female. I was married very young, and so I had this uh, romantic notion about what marriage should be. I remember sitting on the porch and thinking, oh my God, I have made a mistake. This is not what I thought it would be. I have no place to go. No one will accept me coming back and saying I made a mistake. No one would really understand. Actually, not even girlfriends. Because, you know, oh, you married this great guy. That there was just no one I could talk to. Well, marriage is, you know, boring, everybody says, right? And there is this feeling, is this it? Is this all there is? Um, I think a lot of women have had that feeling and have thought that the answer to it was an affair. Emma Bovary is starting to become more and more depressed. She doesn't eat anymore. She changes physically. Charles is not very smart, but at the same time, he thinks that changing places is probably going to help. Charles can't think of any other way to cure Emma than to leave their small town in the French countryside. Madame Bovary is glad to leave. The new town couldn't be any worse, she reasons. And besides, She's pregnant. The Bovary's move to another small country town. Although she doesn't yet know it, Emma has come one step closer to temptation. One of her new neighbors is Leon, a sensitive young law clerk who is instantly attracted to Madame Bovary. Leon, too, is profoundly unhappy with the small town bourgeois life all around him. They are talking in stereotypes, in romantic stereotypes, but they understand each other, and Charles never understood Emma. So for her, it's a radical change. She begins to torture herself with forbidden thoughts of Léon. He is her dream lover, but when can they ever be together? In France during this period, women are under the marital authority of their husbands. There was the possibility of petitioning for a separation, but these were very, very difficult for women. There was very little recourse, even if they were in abusive marriages. France in the 1840s was a jumble of conservative traditions and radical political thoughts. Flaubert was caught up by the romantic currents in French art and politics when he was sent by his father to study law in Paris. But at age 23, he was seized by epileptic fits and had to return home. He also returned with venereal disease, 
picked up on one of his many youthful trips to a brothel. Two years later, his father died, followed by his beloved sister. Flaubert was left at home with a grief-stricken, demanding mother and a sense of crisis. When Flaubert was 27, his crisis was further heightened by the 1848 revolution. The popular romantic ideals supported by the bourgeoisie were overturned. In the aftermath, the military strongman, Napoleon III, proclaimed himself emperor. This was a critical turning point for Flaubert. I think what 1848 meant for Flaubert was the death of romantic ideals as they were portrayed in political and social action. Flaubert saw his own time as undergoing a crisis in value, a kind of crisis in legitimacy, where the basic values of society were at issue. Flaubert sets out to explore this conflict about romanticism in Madame Bovary, which he began to write in 1852. Emma Bovary shares Flaubert's sense of crisis. Obsessed with Léon, she seeks help from a local priest. On top of all this, Madame Bovary gives birth to a daughter. She's bitterly disappointed. Only men are free, she believes. Not knowing Emma loves him, Léon goes to Paris. Now, Emma maintains the outward appearance of goodness, but inwardly, all she can dream of is another man's embraces. The next day was a funereal one for Emma, and now he was gone. The one bright spot in her life, the one possible hope of happiness. Why hadn't she grasped that good fortune when it had offered itself? Just as Emma feels she is at the end of her rope, a local aristocrat by the name of Rodolphe Boulanger arrives at Charles's office. He will end her days of frustration. Rodolphe sees in a flash that Madame Bovary is starved for love. He hatches a seduction plot. Rodolphe is a very stereotypical character, and Flaubert was aware of that. He has to seduce all of his women. He just wants to have them for a little while and move on. Rodolphe begins his campaign at the first opportunity. When the agricultural fair comes to town, he takes his beautiful neighbor inside to listen to the speeches. He knows that the way to woo Madame Bovary is with romantic cliches. Flaubert was really looking forward to that scene. It is one of the major tour de force of the novel. What Flaubert has done, however, is to intersperse the public speeches by various officials uh, who give out prizes. And here, another kind of rhetoric, which is the love rhetoric, and the two are simultaneous. Madame Bovary is on the brink of adultery. This was the romantic crisis that Flaubert explored with great intensity in Madame Bovary. He dedicated himself to it for 10, 12 hours a day. And he locked himself up almost in a monastic way. And he saw himself as a monk there. He could look out the, at the river and write and write and write. He wouldn't write very much. A paragraph, two paragraphs a day, and then rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it. There was a slow, painful, agonizing uh, process in which he was never, never satisfied. Flaubert had decided that the only really worthwhile goal in life was to create a perfect piece of art. He deliberately isolated himself in his family's country home in order to dedicate himself to this goal. Fortunately for him, the family had means, so he could spend five years writing Madame Bovary, doing nothing else. 
Although he led a Spartan life while writing, Flaubert did have a lover. Louise Collet was a Parisian poet and a renowned beauty. Collet put great effort into breaking through the cocoon Flaubert had built. She never succeeded, but at night, Flaubert would put aside his work and reveal his most intimate feelings to her. When it is evening and I am alone, quite sure of not being disturbed because everyone else in the house is asleep, I open the drawer of the little cabinet I have told you about and I get out my relics to spread them on my table. First, the little slippers, the handkerchief, the lock of your hair, the little bag with your letters in. I read them again. I touch them. A letter is like a kiss. The most recent is always the best. Even though he was deeply in love with Collet, Flaubert profoundly believed that love and happiness could never last. Ever since we said we loved each other, you have been wondering about my reluctance to add the words forever. Why? Because I sense the future. I really don't believe that he could really say, I love you. I think he had such a deep suspicion of romantic love as illusory. Flaubert's attitude toward women was when he needed one or when he wanted one, he would like her to be available. <laughs> But he didn't want uh, that person to uh, occupy center stage, certainly not uh, Louis Collet. Flaubert chose work over Collet, but he did write many details of their affair into Madame Bovary. He was cannibalizing her life. He was using her to learn about women. I've read his letters to Louise Collet, and I've sort of come to hate Flaubert anyway because he was a misfit, a pervert. He couldn't really make a connection with another person. Flaubert's personal life was unusual, but he created a style that broke new ground. His innovation was to write from both inside and outside his characters, rather than using one narrative voice. We hear Madame Bovary's thoughts as if we are her. And we also see her flaws as an outsider observing her. Flaubert brought this technique to bear on one of the most important scenes in the novel, one in which Emma's longings finally overcome her. It is a bright fall day, and Emma is finally going to consummate her fantasies. She finds herself riding horseback with Rodolphe, just the two of them. Ironically, it is Charles who urged her to go riding, for her help. Rodolphe, however, has things other than her health in mind. All was silent. A soft sweetness seemed to be seeping from the trees. She felt her heart beating again, and her blood flowing in her flesh like a river of milk. Nothing around them had changed, and yet to her, something had happened that was more momentous than if mountains had moved. The way it's written is that, once again, the action is interrupted and replaced with a landscape description, a beautiful landscape description, uh, in which you can sense sort of unconsciously when you read it that they are actually making love. I have a love. Far from making her feel guilty, making love with Rodolf makes her bloom. She was full of a delicious sense of vengeance. How she had suffered. But now, her hour of triumph had come. And love, so long repressed, was gushing forth in joyful effervescence. She savored it without remorse, without anxiety, 
without distress. Flaubert looked forward to this scene. He wrote to Louise Collet, his lover, about how intensely he lived every part in the love scene. Today, for instance, as a man and as a woman, as lover and mistress both, I have been out riding in the forest on an autumn afternoon, and I was the horses, the leaves, the wind, the words that they spoke to each other, and the red sunlight that made them half close their eyes, eyes that were brimming with love. Connecting with another is a human longing that is hard to contain, as Dalma Hain found in her research. The women I spoke to did not have affairs because they wanted a fling, or because they were bored, or because they wanted variety. They were looking for connection, a connection that they desperately wanted, but that was missing somehow. Erica Jong picked up the same theme in her 1973 novel, which updates the Madame Bovary story to the 20th century. Her heroine hopes to find herself by taking the plunge into adultery. I think that what you're looking at is an attempt to find selfhood through sexuality. I mean, for a woman hero, it's a way of questing. The quest begins with a longing for more. Sometimes marriage narrows down to a daily routine and a list of chores. Every day I spend hours doing dairy farm manual labor. It's a job with very few benefits. Uh, emotional, financial, difficult. It's very difficult work. Anne has been married for 13 years. Her marriage has been deadened by the relentless rhythm of the farm. On a dairy farm, it's seven days a week, 365 days a year, and there are no days off from the cows, and you cannot skip a milking. Right now, what's missing in my marriage is physical and emotional intimacy. My husband actually seems content with things the way they are, and I'm not, but he's not willing to take any steps to change it. And decided that she couldn't continue to live like this. To live without a sense of being valued and loved and without any kind of intimate connection is to feel cut off from life. That's what it feels like. It feels like death. And by the fifth year of having absolutely nothing in my marriage and having remained faithful, I felt that I was suffocating every night. Despite her depression, Anne felt divorce was out of the question. It would be bad for their children and might bring an end to their family-run farm. She decided to look for a lover on the internet. Within weeks, she found someone. We were emailing back from five and six times a day to dozens of times a day to 50 times a day and finally we met. He was looking for an extramarital relationship because the one with his wife has been lost. And I asked him if he'd like to help me build a fire at a friend's cabin. And he did. And we got the fire going in more ways than one in the cabin. <laughs> Within a week, both of us couldn't sleep, couldn't eat. You know the symptoms. <laughs> but feeling young and alive again, and it's only gotten better since then. Since their first meeting, Anne and her lover have created their own little world. This is our sanctuary. Here in this cabin, I keep things that I would never have in the farmhouse. 
seduction clothes and high heels and makeup and all those sorts of things. Oh. I have discovered that I have within me an entire galaxy of erotic energy. Finding out with someone and sharing the path this is a whole new world for me, I have to tell you. Anne made her fantasy come true. But she knows there are limits to how far it goes. I'm not sure how wonderful it would be if we both left our respective spouses and wound up living together. This is a love affair, not a marriage. Neither of us have had to see each other nasty or sick. So they savor the special time together, time which Anne feels helps her keep her marriage and family together. Still, the situation is bittersweet. Something that has made me feel so much better isn't something I'm going to be feeling guilty about. I will say, I don't know what the future holds. don't know how long it will last. It's my hope that this affair will go on for a long time. In the 1850s, Flaubert wrote, My poor Bovary, without a doubt, is suffering and weeping at this very instant in 20 villages of France. There is more freedom today than in the 19th century, but women and men are still struggling to find happiness. Madame Bovary is consumed by her affair. When she is alone, she fantasizes about Rodolphe. lives and breathes in another world, luxuriating in feelings long suppressed. But the seduction cannot last. The more Emma wants from Rodolph, the less he is willing to give. Rodolph is not the storybook lover that Emma imagines. Sensing Rodolphe's declining passion, Emma splurges on fashionable finery. She hopes that looking glamorous will keep Rodolphe in love with her. Emma is sort of the example of the person who thinks self-esteem can come from without, can come from people loving you, men loving you, or a beautiful shawl, a beautiful petticoat. She's the example of the person with no inner life, no inner self. But her new adornments failed to maintain Rodolphe's interest. As time went on, he stopped making any effort, secure in the knowledge that he was loved. And imperceptibly, his manner changed. Their great love, in which she lived completely immersed, seemed to be ebbing away, like the water of a river that was sinking into its own bed and she saw the mud at the bottom. Emma slides into despair. It is far darker than in the early days because she has lost her innocence. There were no illusions left now. She had had to part with some each time she had ventured on a new path in each of her successive conditions, as virgin, as wife, as mistress. All along the course of her life, she had been losing them, like a traveler leaving a bit of his fortune in every inn along the road. Disaster strikes. Rodolphe sends Emma a letter, telling her he is going abroad, alone, for her sake. Emma succumbs to a fever that lasts for months, fed by a deep well of grief and loss. Charles fears she will not survive. Erica Jong's 20th century Madame Bovary, Isadora, also hits rock bottom when her lover leaves her. 
Jong struggled with whether or not she should end Isadora's life. I didn't know what Isadora would do after her dark night of the soul. Would she throw herself out a window? Would she go home and write a book? Would she get pregnant? Who knows what? And I fought with myself a lot about the ending. At one point, I really wanted to kill her off. And I saw that I was in the grip of a cultural myth that the heroine who reaches out for pleasure and autonomy must always die. Zhang's character accepts her own imperfection and moves on. Emma too gets on with her life, nursed back to health by her husband. Charles, ironically, is the man who truly loves her. <laughs> Charles takes Emma to the opera to help her recover from her months of illness. But her recovery gets its biggest boost when Leon, the sensitive law clerk, walks in. So it's very interesting because she is at first completely obsessed with the opera, but as soon as she sees Leon again, any interest disappears. Leon is bolder this time, having gained experience in Paris. When Charles returns home early, he arranges the rendezvous. And he takes her in a carriage, but we don't see anything. We know what is going on in a carriage. The carriage goes everywhere, and the text is becoming sort of crazy. Emma is now heading down a slippery slope. She's like an addict, willing to sacrifice everything and everyone to live again in her world of romantic fantasies. She's in love with love. She projects her desire for love onto whoever happens to be handy. Um, it's as if she is making up the lover all the time. She's the artist, in a sense. And this is where, of course, Flaubert and his character merge. Because Flaubert, too, in writing, in dreaming, in suffering, is also looking for a perfection, an ideal which he would like to attain, which cannot be attained, however. In Emma's desperate search for the perfect love, Flaubert anticipated our own obsession for constant happiness. In France, the idea of continual longing has come to be called Bovarism. Bovarism is in all of us, all of us who have a bit of imagination, all of us who have a bit of frustration, and imagination makes us aware of our frustration. So it is a vicious circle, and therefore I must love frustrations because they make it possible for me to continue dreaming. Although we know it's only television, commercials still seduce us. They feed the yearning within us for fantasy, excitement, and romance. The great escape can be ours as long as we can afford it. Emma tracks down every man she has known. If I could, Emma, you know that. But nobody can help her. You've got to lend me 3,000 francs. She seems to have run out of all escape routes, but one. She makes a final, flawed, romantic gesture. When Emma eats arsenic, she joins a succession of literary heroines who are unfaithful and die a horrible death. This myth is very great and very enduring. Obviously, Flaubert wanted to create a tragedy, and he created a supremely narcissistic heroine who can't see anybody else's needs, but who we identify with because she's, she's like ourselves in many ways. Flaubert punishes Emma in a deathbed scene that is unrelenting, unromantic, and filled with irony. As Emma lies vomiting and writhing, the last sacraments reawaken the erotic feelings of her convent days. The priest stood up and took the crucifix. She stretched out her head like someone thirsty, 
and pressing her lips to the body of the godman, she imprinted on it, with every ounce of her failing strength, the most passionate love kiss she had ever given. Flaubert wrote Madame Bovary to cure himself of his own romantic tendencies. Many believe he also wrote a masterpiece. A masterpiece is usually seminal. It leads to other possibilities, and it is one that leaves one disturbed. We are not the same after having read it. I think that like all great books, it sometimes angers and infuriates us. And it's not always a book that you think, there, there, nice book. <laughs> In fact, it's the kind of book that makes you say, say, how can he say that? Or that's disgusting. I think there's an aspect of great literature that always provokes. Flaubert's final gothic twist is to make Emma hallucinate a deformed blind man who seems to be beckoning her to help. Emma began to laugh, a horrible, frantic, desperate laugh, fancying that she saw his hideous face, a figure of terror looming up in the darkness of eternity. A spasm flung her down on the mattress. Everyone drew close. She had ceased to exist. A century and a half later, Madame Bovary is a cautionary tale. Emma Bovary ruined her life chasing dreams that could never come true. Flaubert reminds us that in a modern society driven by fantasy and desire, our longings can be our downfall. We must choose our dreams wisely. <laughs>